Thanks all for coming. And uh, I will continue more or less where I started off uh, last time. So, so if you, but, but new, so a new topic. Um, so if you recall, we had this algebra, which had behaved like a, like a derivation or as a, as a, as a product rule, like a derivation, this algebra inside a Bayer tensor category. I just gave it to you. It was a truncated polynomial ring. Um, and now we're going to systematically explore this algebra. So we will in particular find a, what I think is the nicest construction of a quantum group and the systematic understanding of a quantum group. Maybe, so, so basically the main point of my talk will be Nichols algebras and their root systems. And maybe a little disclaimer. So I think I will do this at several points, not usual. I mean, not, uh, not the, the textbook way. Um, there is, in fact, a very nice textbook very recently by Schneider and Heckenberger, which is also very complete. So it really starts the theory where it starts, top algebras and so on. But I somehow also a little bit get get, get away from, from some of the, the things. You Especially you will see that some of the theorems are in wrong order. So the year numbers don't match up. So it's not a historic account, but it's on the other hand, sort of from, from today's perspective, how I would see things. Um, so, but let's first start with a recap of uh, Lie algebras and their root system. So maybe this is boring to many of you, but I think anyhow, it's important and at least you see nice pictures. So, so let's a little bit recap what a root system is. Um, so if we have a finite dimensional, semi-simple complex Lie algebra of rank N, then, then what I mean by that, I mean, of course, I'm in a Lie algebra, but what I mean in the future is basically I have a root lattice. So this is some lattice. The bases are called simple roots, right? The lattice is spanned by these simple roots, alpha one till alpha n. Um, and there's a Carton matrix. So the Carton matrix is built from this formula you can see. So uh, two alpha i alpha j divided by alpha i alpha i. And um, what that basically is, is if you reflect the root i on the hyperplane orthogonal to j, then that's how often you have to subtract j or the other way around thing, i and j. So if you subtract the root j, as you see in the formula, uh, on the hyperplane orthogonal to i, you have to subtract aig times the root i, right? So that's the, that's the main picture too, so keep in mind. So not orthogonal. <laughs> A bit like this. So there is this hyperplane. So here's alpha i, here's alpha j. And so the, the reflection on this hyperplane is here ri of alpha j. And this is the Carton matrix. And we require that this is an integer. So that's actually the main condition that will always play a role. And then from this, what you have very roughly is you have a, a subset of vectors in this lattice called roots. And they are stable under this reflection operations. So some of the minimal thing that you get when you start with your simple roots and you start reflecting on the hyperplanes, you get new roots. And, and we want that this is a finite set. I mean, of course, we can look at infinite dimensional root systems, but I mean, infinite uh, root systems, but that's not, that's not the point. So, so that is a little bit the, the setup that you know from Lie theory, maybe. And uh, let's see how, how examples of this look like. So the, the question that we want to ask is, in the end, so I think I can just ask this as a lattice question. So how many how many configurations of such vectors do you have that are stable under reflecting on the hyperplanes? That's a question I can ask. So this is nice symmetric bunches of vectors that span a lattice. And in particular, I want those that are crystallographic, and that's the name of that this is integers. Or equivalent to this, I want sort of root systems that are space filling. You will see this in the examples. So you can repeat them and, and make a lattice out of it. Um, and what one does is um, one takes a Dinkin diagram. So I think a, ver a, a vertex for each base vector. And I draw an edge if the angle is not 90 degrees. So if they talk to each other. Um, and I decorate the edge depending on the angle. And now, so the first thing we have to check is which angles are possible for two basis vectors. So we start by sort of classifying, everybody knows this, we start by classifying uh, this whole thing in with two simple roots. And what turns out is with two simple roots, I have these three possibilities that are space filling, so that are crystallographic, that have an integer aij. So of course I can have an arbitrary n-gon, so an arbitrary n-gon will be stable under reflections, but then only these choices of length uh, I have this condition. And note that actually there's two different notions. So I have hyperplanes, but I also have chosen specific normal vectors because this condition depends on your choice of normal vectors. 
So it's it's a set of hyperplanes <clears throat> and as a choice of normal vectors such that this integrality condition holds. And these are the three cases. And we decorate um, the the edge between the two points, the two points, say the two basis vectors alpha one and alpha two, with one minus aij edges. So zero edges means they are orthogonal. One edge means they have 120 degrees. So you subtract one time if you reflect. Two edges means 135, I think. Uh, and you, so you reflect two times, and uh, um, three edges means you have to if you reflect, you have to subtract the vector three times. So if you go here, if you reflect on the hyperplane orthogonal to this root, you subtract one, two, three, and then you're out of the picture. Right? That's the point. So now uh, let's look at another example because I will draw pictures like that very soon. Um, in three dimensions, for example, we have this root system. So that's A3. Everyone of you knows that. Um, it consists of six hyperplanes in a three dimensional uh, plane, in a, in a three dimensional uh, picture. So all the planes go through zero, right? So there's six hyperplanes through zero. I, I draw the, the intersection with a sphere. So each of these circles is a hyperplane intersecting the sphere. And I decorate them by the roots. So, so here's the, the equator is the root two. So that the, the root two is normal to that. It's going in this direction. This is the hyperplane. And there's a root one and a root three. And let's now think about this picture for a little bit. So first of all, it's clear that we have this thinking diagram because if you see one and two have here a 60 degree angle. Two and three also, but one and three have 90 degrees. So they are orthogonal, they don't talk to each other. So that's encoded by this diagram. So you could say, I could draw this diagram in this chamber here. This is called a white chamber. So this is a basis. So this is three hyperplanes. And if you take the normal vectors, it's one choice of a basis. It's the one we start with. So here you have these three hyperplanes and their angles are 60, 60, and 90. And that's what encoded by this diagram. So actually the diagram is something I, I uh, decorate this chamber with. And now you start uh, reflecting. So if I reflect on this one, I take this formula. And if I reflect on two on the one hyperplane, because the Cartan matrix entry is minus one, I have to add two one time. So I get this. So the reflection is this. I mean, you can see it. If you're a little bit used to these pictures, you can just see. So there's two. I mean, this is the reflection plane, and this goes reflected to this. So this is a root one, two. And now you continue until, until you get a nice ball. And it's not guaranteed that you get a nice ball. You do it because this is one of the diagrams that we want to find, it's because there is a root system like this. That's why this terminates. And by the way, uh, if you deform this a little bit, you see it's actually tetrahedron. And this makes sense because the three reflections, R1, R2, R3, uh, generate the Coxeter group S4, so like three neighboring transpositions. And S4 is exactly the reflection group of this. So if you continue reflecting, that's the group you will get. Um, and that's also why if you count, there's exactly 24 of these uh, chambers of these triangles, because the, the reflection group sort of transitively acts on this, on this uh, triangles, right? So there's 24, 12 on the front and 12 on the back if you count. And that's also, of course, the symmetry group of a, of a tetrahedron. So that picture you should keep in mind because we will generalize that. Is there? Mm -hmm. I think there's still no questions, right? Because I think you all know that better than me. Um, so, so let's now continue with classification. So and you know what the result is. I think this is one of the very beautiful parts of, of algebra. Um, uh, so, so you can classify those. And basically what you do is you first go to Dinkin diagrams and you classify the Dinkin diagrams. So you classify which Dinkin diagrams give positive definite metric. So you somehow reverse the process. You just write down a metric that has the Dinkin diagram and you check if it's positive definite. So you use alpha one till alpha n as a basis and then check what the gram matrix is. And then you find sort of some, some rules. So there cannot be like whenever there is a long chain, you can contract it to one chain. It should still be a root system. So that automatically means, um, and then you check that if you have one point and four neighbors, that doesn't work. This is uh, uh, not positive definite. And then you immediately know if you have two branches anywhere in the picture by this contraction rule, this cannot be. And, uh, and then somehow that's what happens. And, uh, so then you have to check how long you can go in each direction. And there's sort of the boundary cases are, if you go here one further, it's not, when I mean, you check like all the boundary cases, so it's somehow a very by hand at some point. But this is all the cases you get. And this I think is very well known. Call the series A and B and C and D and the five exceptionals. So for example, in dimension three, uh, 
we have five platonic solids and they correspond to this five different root systems. So A3 we had, and this B3 and C3, note that those are dual to each other because the hyperplane arrangements that you have are actually the same, but the choice of normal vectors are different. So one time there's a lot of long roots and one short, and one time there's a lot of short roots and one long. So that's what happens. So these are dual to each other. And these two would be stable under reflection. So they are symmetric platonic solids, but they are not space filling. So you, they, they don't have integral condition here. So if you calculate, there's uh, stuff, stuff with uh, diagonals in five bonds going on, and this is not an integer. So those are not space filling, we exclude them. And I, and I say this like this because when people talk about generalized root systems, very often they talk about generalized to these cases to drop the crystallographic condition. But that's not what we're going to do. So we will still exclude those. What we will drop, let me say that in, in, uh, in advance, what we will drop is that not all of these chambers have to look the same. But we will keep this crystallographic condition for reasons that become very obvious. And then in dimension four, you have this new series. So there is a nice piece of jewelry I found online once. I used it sometimes in talks. Uh, so this is how it looks in four dimensions. Uh, and then in six, seven, eight, you can draw these pictures. So you have root systems with 72, 162, and 240 vectors. If you project them, they look like this, and so on and so on. So this is sorry. So this is how root systems look like. So there's a bunches of vectors in a in a vector space with scalar products. Yeah. With integrality conditions that are sort of stable under their own reflection group that they generate. Um, and just for those of you who may who maybe not know, um, let's very briefly recap how the Lie algebra is actually connected to the root system. Just in an example, I will not do the theory, but in an example. So let's take the Lie algebra of traces three by three matrices. So uh, there is um, eight of those. If you have trace zero, there's eight of those. And you take the commutator as a bracket, then you can uh, just pick two of them and diagonalize the action. So which we pick is the diagonal ones. This is called the Carton part. And then you start diagonalizing the rest. That's also what you could do in physics, of course, right? You find the eigen, eigenstates simultaneously under these two. Um, and then you find three upper triangular matrices and the commutator of these two is the third one. And you find the same opposite here. And now what you do is basically you, these, these three, and also these three, are simultaneous eigenvectors under this and this. And what we're doing is we draw a, a two-dimensional diagram. So intrinsically, there's nothing to do with this here. Intrinsically, there's two commuting guys here. And we draw a diagram where we draw the simultaneous eigenvalues. So this, for example, has an eigenvalue, I think, two under this and minus one under this. And for this, is the other way around. And the eigenvalue of this is the, sorry, this, and the eigenvalue of this is the sum of these two eigenvalues because the bracket of this is this. So somehow it's it's additive undertaking the bracket. And if we draw this picture, we exactly see that these two agents live here, and then there is one vector each here. So somehow that's the structure you see in the Lie algebra. You, you pick a, I mean, we all know that, you pick a diagonal uh, abelian subalgebra, and then you, you sort of uh, diagonalize everything simultaneously and you get these nice pictures. And also for modules, right? You can draw nice pictures involving this lattice again. So somehow the root system is the, for me, the main, the main thing that I use when I, when I work with these things. Yeah, so that's it. So now let's take, so I just want to recap this. Let's take a step back and now start with these algebras that we had last time. Is there any questions so far? I think not, right? I, I want to start immediately with an upshot so you know where we where we going? So, if you if you would force me to give the shortest definition of what a Nichols algebra is, in my interpretation, so is you have any object in a braided tensor category. Now, what you can do is you can take the tensor algebra of X. That's an algebra that also becomes a Hopf algebra if you treat X like a Lie algebra element. So I can I can look at the tensor algebra T X. And I can take this product rule. I'm basically trying to build sort of on the free algebra. I'll go back. <laughs> I tried to, on the free algebra, I'm trying to build a, a Lie algebra derivation rule. Of course, I can do this by the universal property. And now the question is what is the smallest Hopf algebra quotient? So I somehow want to divide out everything that I can divide out and are left over with sort of the minimal thing that can have this co product. 
So as I said, if you write this out for elements, it's delta x is one tensor x plus x tensor one. So that's the main question we ask. And this question is surprisingly subtle. And root systems pop up. I think this is even more surprising. So this is a very general question, but it has to do with root systems. Um, please, please, don't interrupt me. Is it? Sure. Can you define smallness like by uh, by by quotients? So so question to get something smaller. Exactly. So 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 what you can look is you can I mean one way of formulating is I can take in the tensor algebra the maximal ideal then you can prove it's a maximum there's this one maximal ideal that does not intersect with degree one so it leaves the x invariant it does not divide up anything with x but it might divide out higher stuff. Right. And practically, what you sometimes do is you start with a tensor algebra and then you prove that certain things, like we had last time, right? Certain things are derivations. They so that you can set them zero. There is a well-defined quotient. And now you sort of do this, but the new things are maybe derivations, and then you do this process until you terminate. So this is a very practical way how really we construct them in cases where we have no theory, we can just do it like that. I mean, we we guess derivations and sort of kick all of them out. So this is an alternative definition, by the way. Um, you can say it's the unique Hopf algebra that has derivations, but no more. So there is no higher derivations because if there were, I could divide them out and that somehow all that can go wrong. Um, now let's look at uh, the very easy case that one should have in mind, although it's a sort of degenerate case is suppose the braiding of CX with itself is symmetric. Then what we will see in a couple of slides is that this is actually commutative. It's braided commutative. So in particular, what you get is the symmetric or the exterior algebra if your braiding is plus or minus one. Um, and, and I like to think about this, and we will see this in the root system, I like to think about this uh, as somehow the, the, the natural concept of what happens if you try to write on a Lie algebra in a braided context. And to be a little bit more specific, let's now restrict ourselves to a specific type of braiding. So the braiding we have, want is that we have some basis and some numbers, some prefactors, q, i, j, such that if I braid, I just get this prefactor. So this is the easiest type of braiding where you know just work with prefactors. It's called diagonal braiding, braiding of diagonal. And what you immediately get, and I think this is the, 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 the great result at the end of this, the, the observation why it justifies to study those is, let's start with a semi-simple finite dimensional Lie algebra like before, with simple roots alpha i and the root lattice, and some choice of a complex number q. Let's define a braiding like that. So it's Q to the killing form. It's Q to the scalar product in your space. Then you can compute the Nichols algebra. And what it is, is exactly the positive part of the quantum group. So all that you know in the quantum group, all you have in Lie theory, just follows sort of from giving the braiding that comes from the diagonal part. And I think that's great. So there was one point now where I expected that maybe somebody protests, oh, I don't know, when I said this. Uh, so I said, for me, Nichols algebras are something like the, the braided version of a Lie algebra. But now suppose you have an honest Lie algebra or super Lie algebra. That's not what this tells you, right? I mean, this wants to be then a symmetric or an exterior algebra. And that's a subtle point on which I want to comment, but maybe not go, I mean, not, there's nothing else to say, but this is something confusing maybe. So I think the point is as follows. It's the smallest one. So if you are in a symmetric or an exterior setting and you have a Lie algebra, if you want, you can make it smaller. So you can go to the graded algebra, that's a symmetric algebra, or the exterior algebra. But you're free to sort of impose more interesting relations on top of it. But when you go to the graded algebra, that's all that's there. And here, if the braiding is present, somehow you're not, you don't have the freedom. You, you, you really have to have the Lie algebra structure present. Um, and still you can impose additional relations, but a large chunk of here you already see. So somehow we're not really deforming the Lie algebra, we're like deforming the exterior or the, the symmetric algebra. But they get much more big and much more complicated. And somehow the fact that we see Lie algebra structures in the quantum group at Q equals one is somehow a shadow of, um, in the braided setting, it has to be like that. And for the Q equal one setting, it could be the symmetric algebra, but it could also be something higher. And that's an effect, I'm, I'm saying that like that because on the screenings we will see exactly this. So there's two different relations that you get for screenings. One come from poles and one come from the monodromy. And somehow the, the one from the monodromy give you Nichols algebras and the poles give you sort of additional relations. And if you are in the case of local screenings, you only see those relations. And for the short screenings, you only see those relations, but there's cases where you see both. 
So somehow that's a little bit, but maybe that was now too too much. Yeah, please. So in the example at the bottom, what is yeah. the kind of you see and the object text? You can choose. It, it, it can be anything, any braided tensor category in which there is a, a object of dimension M with this braiding. So the easiest thing would be again to take a graded vector spaces. So take A to be to be something like the, the R to the N, in which the lattice is embedded, for example, and take this as a braiding, which is like the standard braiding you would take. I mean, think about Heisenberg. This is the, the braiding you would get. Uh, and then immediately you, you can realize your X. So that's the picture from the VUA side. You would start with the Heisenberg VUA. So this is vect R to the N with this braiding. And then uh, you take an object X with the right degrees, and then the braiding is automatically like this. So your alpha i's would be your degrees in R to the n. Yeah, please. So, so it's a good question, but would you find the braiding only for one object or for the complete category? You should take it. You should take it. Uh, Rn is a category mm -hmm. vector space, space mm -hmm. but you, you have a braiding which is only uh, depend on the basis of Rn. Interesting point, because the structure of the Nichols algebra only depends on the intrinsic braiding. So it's enough to say the vector space with the following braiding. So it's not necessary to embed it in an ambient category. Um, but of course, it's helpful as soon as you start, you know, for example, looking at representations of this. I mean, you can, there is articles where people just started with a braiding matrix, and then they somehow say, let's introduce the category generated by this object and the braiding on all tensor powers we get. Or something. I mean, you can like do that. But for me, it's more natural to say, suppose we have an ambient category and a braided object. But of course, for a given braiding matrix, I can sort of make it up. I can take that to the end and some, let me just write down what I want. But, uh, but yes, that's a good observation. It only depends on the braiding. It also it doesn't depend on the category. So you can have different categories, really with like different sets of simple objects. The different decompositions of X into simple objects would still have the same braiding matrix and the Nichols algebra will not know. So you can use this for some constructions. So it's really just an invariant of the braiding. And that, that what, what, I, what I now want to do. So, so somehow this is the, the, the main idea, but now we want to go away from categories and Hopf algebras and so on, and want to just compute the Nichols algebra from the braiding, especially in this case. And I think this is the most instructive thing to do. So I'm switching from the very global perspective to the like completely combinatorial perspective. Any more questions on this? Say so again, what actually is the category and the object gates in the second example? The most simple example is in the second example. In the second example, well, I mean, there are several, but the one I would take is take vect A, where A is, I mean, let's take R to the N, right? And let's take the braiding. Sorry, what's, what's vector R to the N? Uh, R to the N vector spaces. Oh, okay. That's representations of the Heisenberg algebra, right? And the braiding is that the braiding is that's exactly what we had C A C B. The braiding is E to the I pi A B. That's the monodromy of the Heisenberg algebra. Mm -hmm. Modules. Z N because usually we want a finite. Right? Yeah, yeah. But of course, we can compactify. <laughs> then you get lattice view ways. But let's. But the easiest example is not compactify, even that it's infinite. Maybe it makes you nervous, but that's much easier. I mean, I mean, you don't have any lattices going around. I mean, just take this. R to the n gray vector spaces. That's exactly in bijection to modules over the Heisenberg VUA. I mean, you're VUA people here in this room a lot. Then this is the braiding that you get, right? And now let's take lambda, the root lattice. I mean, literally in R to the n. Um, and then take alpha i over square root p. So this is the root, and this is scaled by p. Then what is the braiding factor? Qij is e to the i pi alpha i over square root p alpha j over square root p is e to the i pi over p to the alpha i alpha j. So that's uqg plus at a two p through the p. That's the case that you get. You get the triplet algebra. So what is x? Sorry. What is x? Uh, x would be now the direct sum of c alpha one over square root p. So of e. So like this. So the simple roots like the tangent space. It's an object generated by the simple roots. Good question. Thank you. Uh, well, that was yeah. the question.
Yeah, also, but uh, you, you, you also, and you also. <laughs> so, and also, again, uh, you should force me to explain this better. Yeah. The, and the slides you take the conversion, so scaling alpha and alpha j to be to have integer scalar products. I scale them to have non integral scalar products because that's interesting. Yeah, because uh, a root system does not depend on the scaling. I mean, exactly. Uh, but in this case, you divide by. Uh, exactly. But, uh, but you want that the scalar product. Alpha and alpha j is an integer. Yes. Okay. Yes, but I want, but I want this for so the Exactly. I mean, I can't do it for for p equals one, uh, but but then I get the problem that I get a symmetric algebra. I don't get I don't get back the quantum group. I get a symmetric or or serial algebra. There was another question. Oh, sorry. Just to be clear on Thibault's point. So you're scaling the uh, the the roots so that the Golfers root has length. Two, one. Uh, um, in in the non simply laced case, I will have this next lecture, but I can answer nevertheless. In the in the shortest in the short in the non simply laced case, you rescale with a convention that the short root has length two and the long root has length four, and you rescale by p. But then, in order to get a lattice view a, so the lattice view a, you you realize that in is then the co root lattice, and you have to know that p is divisible by the lattice. So somehow you get some subtleties, but yes, that's what you're doing. I mean, you really want this this condition, period. So that's there was another question. In, in the case of the p equal one, yeah, uh, you can get the extension of the Heisenberg vertex operator algebra and get new VOA What is it? Well, in the in the case of p equal one, the Nichols algebra, this is just plus minus one. It just will be an exterior or or symmetric algebra. Mm -hmm. So that the Nichols algebra it drops in complexity because because suddenly you can divide up a lot. That's mm -hmm. what I said before. Um, it's not like you get UG, <laughs> not at all. You get sim sim G. Right? You get a large quotient of. of uh... So this is I'm gonna have a very dumb question because I only really think about fusion categories and when you write down vec R to the N, I'm just trying to think: is the topology of R to the N used? Are we thinking of it? Okay, so it's I'm just... not making any claims about topology or what this infinity should make sense. Okay, so basically you would go to the compactification and then you're over some lattice and you have to choose a large enough lattice such everything's contained. I see. But okay. but I, but I think so from the perspective of representation theory and from the physics perspective, sort of that's the most natural example. Just okay. graded vector spaces and the braiding just depends on their failure to be integral. And that's exactly what we should have in mind. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Good. So now let's become more combinatorial. So um, there is one elementary definition, which is somehow like a sidearm of, of the theory of Nichols algebra, but I think for this purpose it's very helpful. So um, what we can do is we have an obvious homomorphism from braids to permutation, right? I mean, if I have a braid, in several strands, something like this. Then this immediately gives me an element of the permutation group because I can look where my strands go. I mean, a braid is in particular a permutation, but it's a permutation with a history. So, um, but it is not split. There is a there is there is a, a section of sets in the other direction, but this is not a section of groups. Right, because braiding two times is not the same as uh, not braiding. But there is a well defined section that we can define. It's called Matsumoto section. And it does the following it maps a transposition to an overcross braiding. So it's a choice. We choose the overcrossing, for example, or undercrossing. And, and then any reduced expression of transpositions we map to the respective product of braidings. Notice the word reduced, so that's why it's not a group homomorphism, but notice the word any, so there is a well-definedness property hidden here. So now the question is, if we have two different shortest presentations of a permutation by transpositions, and I sort of convert them to braidings, do I get the same braiding? And in fact, I do, because there is the theorem of Matsumoto that says exactly that. It says if you have two reduced expressions, then you only need the braid relation to come from one to the other. You never need to sort of use that the square of transposition is one to go back and forth. And that's why this is well defined. Let's see this in an example. So for n equals three, you have six elements in S3. Where do they go? The trivial element is the trivial braid. The element one, two is this overcrossing. The element two, three is this overcrossing. The element one, two, three is this overcross, this overcrossing for both. Two, three, one, two, this. And now for, for one, three, if you want to switch the outer uh, 
uh, guys, one and three, you have two choices how to write this as a product of transpositions. And this gives me this braid, this gives me this braid, but they are the same braids. They're equal in the braid book, and that's the point. That's why I say any. So it's a well-defined as property uh, hidden here. But it's not multiplicative because if I take the product of two sh shortest expressions, which are not shortest, then if I take the product of the braids, I will have sort of a lot of entangling, but, but in the symmetric group, they cancel and I get something shorter. So it's not multiplicative. And somehow the Nichols algebra measures exactly how much this is not multiplicative. And that's why for the symmetric braiding, we get something boring. Um, yes. So let's now define it. <clears throat> so the definition goes as follows. Let Cx be a vector space with a braiding. So we don't need the ambient category, but we can imagine this in an ambient category. Uh, and I'm sure you can make up some categorical definition if this is not a category of vector space. Now, what the braiding gives you, the braiding on the, on the vector space gives you an action of the braid group on k copies of x, right? Because it tells you how to switch two copies of x in this tensor power. So for any k, for any tensor power of this vector space. And now let's, so let's look at the tensor algebra. This is sort of the largest algebra I can define generated by x. So this is one, then it's x, then it's arbitrary products in two x's, arbitrary products in three x's, and so on. So this is the structure of the tensor algebra, free algebra, if you want. And now let's look in each degree at the quantum symmetrizer. So what I do is I sum over all permutations, take the Matsumoto section, so they take the respective shortest braid that realizes it, and act with this shortest braid on the case tensor power. And this, I, I, I divide out the kernel of this. So one has to think in the examples, maybe we'll see what this means. So somehow I want to somehow force to make it commutative, but I don't divide out commutators. I somehow divide out the stuff that can be divided out maximally. And the fact that this is even an algebra is not trivial. It has to do with uh, see what an N braid and an M braid, how they can entangle. So it's a theory which is not difficult, but also work. So for example, the quantum symmetrizer on level two, so the first non-trivial level, quadratic relations, is the identity on V tensor V plus the braiding. Now, step-by-step step, look at very simple examples of this definition. So is, is this definition clear, yeah? Um, what is Q in the uh, V Ah, thanks for spotting this. Q should be a C, because later C always comes from QIJ. <laughs> yes, the key, yes, thank you. This is a C, it is not a C. Um, Kind of try maybe I feel like I'm missing something obvious. I feel like I'm not immediately seeing why this is actually a map. Uh, like where 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 where, where is like the input going? <laughs> it's a map from x tends k to x tends k. Right, you have several maps going there. For example, identity, identity, brain, oh, identity, I see, identity, I see, I see. identity, identity, and so on. Sure, and I it's see, a combination yeah. of those. Yeah, okay, see. You, you, you pick yeah. out certain all shortest braids to realize all different permutations. And again, the fact that this is not coherent, this choice is not coherent, you don't have a, a, a good system of representatives in the braid group is exactly what we're measuring. If there would be a good system of representatives, it would be boring. We get the exterior algebra or maybe cumulative algebra or something like that. So is everybody comfortable with the definition? Then I will go for examples. Yeah, please. Is the definition equivalent the one you gave uh, to start with? Yes. So there's a couple in between, but that's, I think, the fun part. So this very elementary definition, it does not use the Hopf algebra structure at all, is equivalent to the fact that it's, the, it's a Hopf algebra quotient of the tensor algebra. If I choose the elements in X to be derivations, and in fact, this is basically basically because what I showed you at the, at the very beginning. So suppose that you have these accidents in Q numbers, then somehow the uh, some element in the, in the tensor algebra is again a derivation, which means it's a hop ideal and I can divide it out. And somehow you have to prove that this is all that can happen. So somehow the idea is that whenever, if there is, if there is no derivations in the tensor, in the quotient, then you cannot do anything else either. So somehow the derivations are the only thing that can uh, sort of be super, super, super Lewis. But this is, a, I can compute. So this is not the right definition for most of the proofs, except the one I will show you in the, in the end of next talk. But, uh, but for the proofs, usually you use the universal properties with the Hopf algebra and so on, because you can you have more structure. But this is, I think, the most elementary definition. You can really go and compute layer by layer what it is, but the, it's from this definition, you have, in most cases, no chance of 
for example, finding generative simulations or determining the dimension, even if the dimension is finite to infinite, it's very difficult to check, except in the little examples I show you. So um, let's take the simplest example is one dimension. And this is exactly the one we had last time, right? Let's take one object with a self braiding of Q, Q some complex number invertible. So it's a one dimensional vector space over any field K. Um, and now let's compute the Nichols algebra. So I claim that usually it's the polynomial ring, which is the tensor algebra. So generically, I cannot divide out anything. But if there is an accident, then I get a truncation by x to the L, exactly like last time. And the accident that can happen can be formulated exactly as follows. If 1 plus q and so on plus q to the L minus 1 is 1. If you remember last time on the slide, that was exactly what we used to get again a derivation. And there is two main reasons why this can happen. First one is if the order of Q is L and Q is not one. So if this is an, a root of unity of exact order L, and this is what we had last time, or if the characteristic of the ground field is L and Q is one. And these are exactly the two different cases we had on the slide last time. So this condition somehow means either characteristic L or L root of unity or something in between. I mean, there's, if L is not a prime, there's like a mixture. And let's prove that by really applying the quantum symmetrizer. And then we, let's go slowly through the calculation. So there is only, in x to the k, there's only one element, right? And there's just x tensor x tensor x. So what I do, and now the q is right, what I do is I sum over all permutation, take the shortest braid, realizing this permutation, which is something, at example, n equals three. And now I want to act with this braiding on this element. But what happens? For every braid, I just get a factor of Q. I mean, the element stays the same, I just get a factor of Q because I switch two neighboring axes. So what I get is Q to the length of the shortest braid, but this is exactly the length of the shortest expression in terms of neighboring transpositions. So it's the length of this, of the symmetric group, of this element in the symmetric group. So I get this big polynomial in Q. And luckily this polynomial factorizes very nicely and into this. This has to do with invariant theory. And for example, if I do this for n equals three, I have a picture before, no, no braidings, one crossing on the left side, one crossing, two crossings, two crossings, and the last one is three crossings. So this is very explicit, this polynomial, and I can factorize this in, two, in these two. This is uh, the general case. So now the Nichols algebra was defined as the tensor algebra, which is here the polynomial ring, divided by the kernel of the quantum symmetrizer in each degree. So what is the kernel of this map? Well, it's everything if the factor is zero and nothing if the factor is not zero. I have to see when, for which degree K, which degree of, of the tensor algebra, for which degree this factor is zero. And you see this exactly happens if this factor gets zero, which is exactly in this case. So in particular, this third power will be zero, either if Q is minus one, then it was already zero one level below, or if Q is a third of unity. So already the fact that this is an ideal is non-trivial, right? I mean, you somehow see, not just, you don't see this, that this is zero because it's a third of unity, you see it's also zero because it's the second root of unity. And this is consistent with the fact that then one below it's already zero. So, so somehow you see it's an ideal. So this is the main definition, I think. The questions to this. I think it's very good to go through this one time. I hope it goes slow, slow enough. So this is the Nichols algebra. So I get truncation if I have some self-braiding and otherwise I get no truncation because the L's power of a derivation is a derivation under this condition. Right? So uh, let's, now, let's now look at uh, more relations in rank two. So with two X's. So let's have an X1 and X2. So now basically I'm doing what I do for Lie algebras, right? I look at rank two. X1 and X2 with a diagonal braiding. Then the claim is that I have a quadratic relation that this Q commutator is zero if and only if this, the braiding was symmetric. And this is a very nice exercise, but maybe I do it nevertheless. Let's try. Oops. Maybe not. I think this is a good exercise. So, so let's, let's try to find any linear combination, maybe the minus convention, any linear combination that is zero in the Nichols algebra. Can there be a linear uh, quadratic relation? 
Well, let's calculate. So this is a shaft, by the way, a Russian shaft uh, for shuffle. Um, let's compute what this is. So this is, well, xi, xj plus qij, xj, xi. This is the first term. Minus a, xj, xi, minus a, and I have to switch j and i, qji, xi, xj. So I get these four terms. It's the quantum symmetrizer of this term and of this term. And the question is, when is it in the kernel of the quantum symmetrizer? So when, if you symmetrize, it becomes zero. And let's see, well, this most certainly happens for this to happen. I need A to be QJI inverse. And at the same time, I need A to be QIJ, to, to get both terms at the same time. And that exactly means that they're a symmetry. And conceptually, this makes sense because, so, so suppose you want to define a Q commutative ring. You want to define xi, xj minus qij, xj, xi to be zero. But you also want to define xj, xi minus qji, xi, xj to be zero. But these two relations are not consistent unless the braiding is symmetric. So somehow the Nicolet algebra sort of divides out stuff it can consistently and the rest it just doesn't touch. And that's why generically you get a free algebra. And as soon as there is accidents in qij, you get some relations. In particular, I get exterior symmetric algebra. In the case, it's a braiding plus or minus one. Um, let's now generalize this a little bit. And this is a nice exercise. Um, let's take two elements with a diagonal braiding. I ask when the iterated braided commutator is zero. And it turns out this happens in two cases. Either if there is this accident happening between the double braiding and the self braiding, or if this accident is happening, which means that xi to the m is zero. So there's like two different reasons why this commutator can break off. I would call this the geometric reason because that's the reason we have on the Lie algebra side usually, or the truncation reason. So there's the reason that, you know, for a fermion, if you have a two commutators with a fermion, it's zero, but not because anything is well with the other element, but just because the fermion square is zero. So somehow being a fermion like immediately tells you that the second commutator is zero, just because it's a fermion. Without regard to the other element, it doesn't matter what the other element is. So those are the two different reasons, and that's exactly what will now happen. Yeah. So those are all the Nichols algebra calculations you can do directly applying this quantum symmetrizer. So let's now see what happens. So now I want to see that there is a reflection theory in an arbitrary Nichols algebra, and I think this is a great thing. Um, we don't put it in from the outside. It's not like that I have an example like this, but I get the, the root system and reflection theory sort of intrinsically from this definition, from an arbitrary braiding. So what we do is we define a reflection to be on a formal space of degrees set to the n. So degrees in the tensor algebra. Um, Aij should be the minimal m such that the iterated commutator is zero. So somehow the length of how long can I go on a root string? How often can I apply a commutator until it's zero? That's exactly what I do for Lie algebras. And now I can spell this out for the diagonal Nichols algebras. Uh, either if this condition is fulfilled for some M or maybe before this condition is fulfilled. So there's like two conditions who tell us when a root string breaks off, truncation reason and this geometric reason. And, and who is first tells what is the Carton matrix element, right? So I'm measuring lengths of root strings. And I've defined the reflection sim simply by the linear transformation that I get from this. So I replace every alpha j by alpha j minus aij. So I replace al alpha j by sort of the highest member of the root string. So I go in each direction as far as I can go using alpha i, yeah? Uh, the, the two lines are the same set, right? Uh, this is general, and this is for diagonal. So it's spelled out what this condition means. Uh, Thanks for the question. Right. Exactly, exactly. Yes, exactly. So, so this is the general definition. And uh, so, so I somehow, somehow reflecting means I go and uh, reflecting on i means I go in every other generator j to the end of the root string, to a very high commutator. And this is what happens. And this doing this gives me a base change and it gives me a new braiding matrix. And it also gives me a new Nichols algebra generated by these new generators. And interestingly, 
categorically, you can see what this reflection does to the category into Nichols algebra, namely it's an element in the bra PK group. And it's called partial dualization. Um, and that little paper with a PhD student uh, and Christoph Schweigert is maybe the, the, the first thing that happened when I when I when I started working in Hamburg. Uh, so basically it, I think it, I think the paper comes from me trying to explain to Christoph Schweigert what a reflection is and he forcing me to use proper language. So, so if you do that long enough, then like you you extract of all these Hopf algebra calculations that are very specific to these cases. I mean, they were talking about abelian groups and so on. They were not talking about tender categories. You somehow have to extract what exactly these conditions mean. And in fact, what it means is suppose you have a category that is built like a tensor category and then modules of an algebra. So it's it's two, two layer structure. What you can do is you can dualize the underlying category, but somehow keep the algebra. So somehow you dualize half of the whole thing. Um, and then you get a new tensor category, and this is two more equivalent to the old category. So, so somehow that's that's an element you get always. It's not really it's Nichols algebra, actually. It's a it's a, a element in the Barra Picard group, which you get. Um, whenever your category somehow looks like a yeah like a two layer structure, you have a semi-direct product, and you have some underlying category, and then some algebra inside there, then you can dualize like half of it and glue it together. And that works in general this construction. Um, and in particular for the Nichols algebras, how it looks like if you think about quantum groups, it's like you have some parabolic subsystem, and you look at the whole Borel part over this parabolic, and then you dualize the parabolic and glue it back together. And if you do that for a, sim a single root for SL two. What you get is exactly the reflection with all the structures. So if you look at Lustig's automorphism, algebra structure, it twists the co-algebra structure and so on. All of this is sort of encoded in the category. And if you look at this book of Heckenberger Schneider, they exactly took over uh, this categorical description because it's much nicer to, to see it that way. And you encode all these calculations you have in the structure of the category. But of course, still, reflection theory is deep, not for categorical reasons, but because really for algebra reasons. But, uh, sound like the category is doing all the work but it somehow encodes all the stuff yes so this is what a reflection is and uh repeating this now a lot of times so reflecting 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 like in the algebra case gives us a set of roots the so roots here really meaning degrees of elements so an element let me say what again degrees an element like xi xj square is like in degree one two so it's really z to the n degree, right? I mean, your initial object has degree n. I mean, z to the n, and then you you know what degree means. Maybe don't. So if you start, if maybe I should just say. So uh, so if you start with an with an object that decomposes. So I call this n now rank. Because usually these are one dimensionals, but in high in more complicated categories, they're not. If I decompose the object like that, uh, then the tensor algebra of X is Z to the N grade. Right? Because I can count how often I have contributions from each summit. And that's what we call degrees, right? That's exactly the root lens. It just tells you sort of in which monomials you are. So this is a statement? This is a difficult statement, yes. Uh, Heckenberg in the diagonal case, and that's Kiewicz, Heckenberg, Schneider, uh, AM, AMS paper uh, 2008 in the case over an, I think, over a, over a semi simple Hopf algebra. So rather general, but not categorically general. Um, this is a statement that, that actually uh, the Nichols algebra of such a, such a direct sum, which you should imagine as sim simple roots, but right, these objects can be more than one dimensional in an arbitrary category, but for them it's always one dimensional. But so in a uh, the Nichols algebra of this decomposes as a linear, as a graded vector space, not as an algebra, as a graded vector space, as the product of Nichols algebras of these simple guys over all roots. So somehow the root system tells you how the Nichols algebra decomposes into Nichols algebras of simple objects, which are usually, I mean, very easy because they're just truncated polynomials. But of course, in general, they can be arbitrarily difficult, right? As I said, yeah. This is a tensor product of graded vector spaces. So it's a it's a it's a graded vector space version of PBW basis, right? If you read it like that, especially you know the character of the Hilbert series. But it's the statement now if the x's are non simple, uh, not one dimensional object, but some complicated simple objects, then it also works. But then maybe it's very difficult to find out these Nichols are simple objects. 
So root system theory tells you how to decompose a Nichols algebra of a semi-simple object into a Nichols algebra of simple objects. And usually those are very easy, but I mean, not always, more complicated cases. Now, now three disclaimers. So the disclaimer is, first of all, this process of reflecting and reflecting and reflecting, there is no promise that this terminates, which you know from our finely algebras, right? I mean, you can get more and more and more. Second, there is no scalar product. So I think this is the most confusing point of the first time you see this. So these reflections are linear involutions. They are linear maps and they are involutive, but they do not preserve any scalar product. Rather, it depends on where this minimum is attained before. So you have two reasons why a root string can break off, this geometric reason and this truncation reason, and, and either of them kicks first. And uh, especially if the second condition is fulfilled, then, then somehow usually if there's a scalar product before, it's afterwards destroyed. But you know this from super Lie algebras. That's what's called odd reflection. If you take a super Lie algebra and you reflect on an odd root, somehow the be being a fermion is more important than the Cartan matrix. It's exactly what happens. It's exactly one example. And, and, and some of your reflection destroys your scalar product. You cannot work with a scalar product. So this is something that you know actually from super Lie algebras. You just didn't see it in the generality. So I think for me, I understood super Lie algebras much better <laughs> once I got the general theory. Um, and also, there is no promise that after I reflect, the braiding matrix is the same. Why should this be? And this is a weird condition when how long the root strings are. And there is also no promise that they even have the same Dinka diagram because this AIJ now can be very different. And again, you know this from super Lie algebra. If you have a super Lie algebra, take an odd reflection, your Dinka diagram might change. And if you look in Katz's book, uh, they, they choose one wild chamber in which they write everything, but actually that's completely choice. I mean, actually you think about super Lie algebra, you should think about all different wild chambers and there is different Dinkin diagrams and different sort of choices which roots are fermions and which are not. And, and this is a collection and reflecting brings you from one to the other. So that's actually something you, you're familiar with, super Lie algebra. And somehow this is now axiomatized, not axiomatized, proof theory, but uh, this is the general thing we get. Questions to that? Yeah? Uh this is seems probably kind of dumb. What is the, what do we exactly mean by the reflection of the, because the reflection, what was the reflection was not, what was the reflection defined on? The reflection was defined on like these formal things, right? These. Yes, reflection is simply the fact that, the fact that, oops, no, this is not working. Oh, yeah. The fact that from <laughs> the element xi in degree alpha i and an element xj in degree alpha j, that if if I if I take the highest non-zero commutator, degree alpha j plus some factor alpha i, and reflection is simply the formal linear map that sends. I should switch it's j here and i here. It switches its alpha j to alpha j plus some copies of alpha i. I mean, it's simply like. Reflection tells you you go at the end of the root string. That's an algebra property, which you can express in terms of QIJs, but it's actually an algebra property. You go to the end of the root string, and that gives you some linear map of, in the space of degrees, mm. like in a sense of an right, polynomial ring and n variables, free algebra and n variables. I and see. this is what the degrees are. And the surprising thing, let me say, is not that we define this. The surprising thing is that this can be classified. And so then when you do RKQIJ, then basically you do the permutation of the degrees and the smooth the degrees around it this way and then get the braiding that exactly. you get. Okay, cool. Thank you. Exactly. But not just in the diagonal case, in the general case. You do sure. get the new object in the category, get a new braiding. So that's what happens. And uh, sorry, I, I think I missed the basic point. Is, um, is this something that guarantees that these strings terminate? No. No, right. Uh, sorry, so I, should have, I should have said the sentence. So if the set is empty, then I, AIJ is simply not, not well defined. So it is possible that in some direction it's not well defined, and then we don't really know what to do. Yeah, it's reflection of the normal. Yes, exactly. But, but for example, if you want finite dimensional, then sort of by, by assumption they are finite. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's different levels of not being defined, right? The reflection cannot be defined in the sense of it's infinite long. Or it can be that reflecting each time it's defined, but there is infinitely many roots you get. Or it can mean that just reflection sort of happens for this weird reason, like for an odd reflection, then the scalar product somehow is messed up, but, but still everything is fine. And terminate up the final degree steps. Um, let's look. So the, and now I'm jumping very much ahead. So it's <laughs> historical. Um, I think the great thing about this, when you see this the first time, you think this is an arbitrary structure. 
I mean, it's some, of course, something you get when you have these Nichols algebras, but it can be anything. But I think the funny point is that it's not arbitrary. You cannot get anything. There is a classification of these root systems. So what we have is basically now root systems that are still crystallographic, sort of by construction, right? Because those, those cosmometry entries count stuff. I mean, they count how long the root systems are long. You cannot... <laughs> um, but but somehow the, the fact that after reflection you have the same thinking diagram is just resolved. I mean, you, why should you have this? You don't even have this for super Lie algebra. So let's try to classify all possible sets of Cartan matrices with reflections. And there's an axiomatization of that in Heckenberger Yamane, for example, or so. Um, let's axiomatize which possible things you can have. And I think the, the best way to do this is now in terms of hyperplane arrangements. So there's hyperplane arrangements, you have hyperplanes, and you have this crystallographic condition, this integrality condition. So you want hyperplanes. It's like for Lie algebras, the way I introduced Lie algebra systems. You have hyperplanes through the origin, choices of normal vectors, such that sort of everything is integral, such that every root has an integral uh, coordinate in the other basis. And you can classify those. And there is infinitely many in rank two. They are classified by triangulation of n-gons. There is still the infinite series A, N, B, N, C, N, D, N. And there is another sort of infinite series, which you know from Lie super algebras, dn, n. This is a new root system with different thinking diagrams. And there's 47 exceptional root systems, including, of course, these five. And that's it. Those are the final root systems. And, uh, and Heckenberger compiled, I mean, that's before, right? Heckenberger compiled for diagonal breakings, where you can compute everything in terms of QIJ matrices. He compiled a list of all possible diagonal Nichols algebras, which are finite dimensional. And basically what he finds is uh, quantum group Borel parts, super quantum group Borel parts, then some Borel parts that look like Lie algebra in characteristic P. I mean, you have some more series of Lie algebras in characteristic P and those pop up again. And then some cases where some primes talk to each other. So mixed cases. I can show you the list later. So but that's two different questions, right? Those are the abstract root systems and those are the braiding matrices which produce finite dimensional Nichols algebras. So there is a map from here to here, but this map is neither injective nor surjective. So think about super Lie algebras. You have different super Lie algebras with the same root system. And also you have root systems here, which you do not get from the diagonal case. Some you get from other cases, some we don't know. So this is, yeah. Um, and typically this QIJ to present now results, this QIJ I should encode as a Q diagram. So I write dots for the elements XI and Q11 is the self braiding and Q12, Q21, I write here the double braiding. So I'm encoding the braiding in the diagram. And we have a formula how to get from this a Dinkin diagram, of course, as I showed you. You have to see one of one or two, one of two coincidences has to happen first. Either this Q11 has to be one, or this double braiding has to be related to this Q11. And either of these happens first, and that's where the root string stops. And so let's look at an explicit example. I think this is good. So the root is in two one, the first non-trivial one. I mean, except for the Lie algebra one, of course, and um, looks as follows. So if you look at the hyperplane arrangement, and this is like the picture we had before, it's a cube octahedron, so it has seven hyperplanes. Um, you can draw the picture like this, or you can draw it, so this are the hyperplanes. You can draw it like this, like before, and you see alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three each have a 60 degree angle. So the Dinkin diagram looks like this, which you would think is an infinite dimensional root system. But it's not because sometimes now root strings will break off prematurely because they put fermions. But, but the root system, the Dinkin diagram looks like that. It doesn't tell you the root system. It's just a Dinkin diagram in one chamber. So it just tells you which, which iterated commutators are zero. Now I do a reflection on maybe alpha one. It's really symmetric. On alpha one, I get this and this. So I get alpha one, two, right? Because, because alpha one on alpha two gives alpha one, two. I get alpha one, three. But now suddenly I'm in a triangle like this, so here's a right angle. So suddenly I'm in a thinking diagram like this, but it's not A3. I mean, the root system is not A3. The thinking diagram looks like A3, but there is an additional root alpha one plus two alpha two plus alpha three. And this additional root sort of goes to this additional root here. So now you have two different thinking diagrams. I mean, it's seven roots. I would, so, so when you look in literature, they usually like look just from one chamber. I think that's the wrong view. Um, so I think you should really think this is a, an object in R3 has seven hyperplanes, and depending on which chamber you choose, depending on which basis of roots you take, in coordinates, your root system looks a little bit different. One time it looks like this, but there's 
uh, alpha one plus alpha two, and there is alpha two plus alpha three, and there is alpha one plus alpha three, and there is alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha three, but that's it. Then it stops, breaks off because it leaves it. So somehow this and this gives the same set of roots, just they look different from different perspectives, different places. Um, and, and in fact, you have two different types of wild chambers, different types of cathol matrices. And in fact, you know this, this is D21 alpha. This is the root system of the super Lie algebra D21 alpha. It has two different wild chambers. So this is not maybe not so surprising. And it's a very good exercise to just check with the formulas I gave that this is really happened. You start with the braiding matrix, okay. you see on the formulas what is the cathol matrix, so how long are the root strings, and then you reflect, and then you for the next one and you do this i think here three steps or so it terminates you have all your roots and so uh in particular there's a realization of this so i'm talking here about abstract root system and now i'm talking about a diagonal braiding matrix that realizes this root system and this is for example where these are all fermions and here the double braiding is q and if i reflect here i have a boson here i have a fermion i have a boson and again the double braiding is on q and some of the fact that you have fermions here is the reason why this root string stop, where they do not get infinite longer. In this context, uh, what do you mean by uh, fermion and boson? Fermion, I mean something with self braiding minus one. Sorry? Self braiding minus one. Okay. But also, I'm using just the, 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 the because it's, it's D21 alpha, so I'm using the language of the super Lie algebra. So there's fermionic and bosonic roots, and uh, that's what happens. And I can compute the Hilbert series um, from this PBW basis. Maybe that's not so important. So the the the, the Nichols algebras generated by by sim simple roots or single roots are just truncated polynomial ring, depending on so here Q is a third of unity. So depending on this or this, um, and then you just write your PBW basis like we would. So you can write this more fancy as a square vector space or uh, just multiply dimensions. And you get some Hilbert series. And also, by the way, the Hilbert series on this side looks different than the Hilbert series on this side, of course, because your base has changed. I mean, of course, each term here bijects to a term here, but the degrees change. You start on different bases. Okay? Please. There wasn't. So the root system is one root system. But now you can ask which diagonal braidings have this root system. And in fact, what you get, so I put it under the rug, and it's good that you ask. So in fact, you get a realization for every diagram like this. If the double braiding here is Q1, here it's Q2, and here it's Q3. And the condition you need at some point is that the product of these three is one. So somehow there's a large family with, uh, I put here just third of unity. But I can put actually any numbers I want as long as they're together one. And that gives me a one parameter family and that corresponds to the alpha. So the alpha is a, a realization thing. It's not that the root system is always the same. Questions about this example? Yeah. D21 alpha here in the theorem of uh, yes, 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 yes. That's a funny thing. So you start with an arbitrary, you start with an arbitrary diagonal grading, and you classify which Nichols algebras are finite dimensional and pop out by themselves all quantum groups for Lie algebras, all quantum groups for super Lie algebras, and a couple of other cases. Okay, so I think you wrote the DIJ. Yeah. So this is you're including D21 alpha. Exactly. The root system is D21. So I want to distinguish very much between the realization, there's a graded object, but the root system is general. It's always D21. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Yeah, no, don't worry. Exactly. So I, at some point, I made this poster. So when I was uh, doing Nichols algebras all, the, all day, uh, so this is a long time ago, but uh, uh, maybe 2000. Yeah, I can read. Um, I put uh, the state of the art at that time. It actually hasn't, hasn't changed so much since that time. Um, the state of the art um, of what we know about Nichols algebras. So which finite one do we know? And let me just talk about this poster, maybe because it's nice because it summarizes everything. It was a lot of work to do. Um, so, so let's see what we have here. So first of all, so the people who usually work on this, so like, like Andoskiewicz, Schneider, Heckenberger, Anchiono, and so on, all, all these, many of these in Cordoba, by the way, and that's why I was a lot of times in Cordoba, um, how they, they work on, they look not as, at, at braided tensor categories in general, but they look rather specific on over an abelian group. So that's in like vect A for some A, or over some non abelian group. And then they go to this GG at the Drinfeld modules, which we had, remember, which had the simple objects. 
which had the simple objects O and then some conjugacy class and then some centralizer. Okay. So they basically look at these two cases and the post only shows these two cases over abelian groups and over non-abelian groups. That's because you need Nichols algebras if you want to classify all Hopf algebras whose semi-simple part is a fixed abelian or non-abelian group. Then you need this Nichols algebra. So it's like an essential part in the classification of Nichols of, uh, of pointed Hopf algebras, for example. And so basically what you have is this long list of what can happen in rank two. So in rank two, we have infinitely many um, root systems, but we have only sort of a finite, not a finite list, but a finite number of families, um, which diagonal gradings give us finite root systems. And then you work out this long list here, which higher and higher and higher rank. And this consists always of a bunch of Q diagrams together with one root system. Not spelled out like that, but uh, basically that's what it is. So for example, you find single entries, which look like this. Q, 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 Q to the minus one, Q to the minus one. Then that's U, Q, SO3, uh, SO4, right? So that's, I think, this entry here. And then you find some with several entries. So for example, here you see this triangle and this guy, this is D21 alpha. And you go up this list and there are several exceptions, but at some point you just have series. So from here on, it's uh, larger, than, larger than five, uh, only a couple of exceptions appear. So this is a long, long, long list. Maybe the list by itself is not even so interesting, but it's interesting that you can really, it terminates. And basically you do it like the algebra. So you start with rank two and then you see what can happen in rank three. And then at some point you just end up in series. And the series are basically the ones you think. The series are, I think, yes, only super quantum supergroups. The algebras and super algebras are the only sort of asymptotic thing that can happen. And, and then you can ask what happens for non-obedient groups. And these guys are of course then not one dimensional. So now you have Nichols algebras where your, your sort of simple roots are not attached to one dimensional vector spaces, but to irreducible representations of the group, or irreducible guys like this in the Rinfeld center. Um, and now you can ask, so you have to ask two questions. You have to ask which root systems do you get if I have semi-simple objects like this? And how do the Nichols algebra look like of a single object like this? So simple object in the Rinfeld center. And uh, that's where they started. So in fact, the, the second question is much more difficult. So when you start for, for simple objects, so here I draw one, one box with several dots inside, it's one of these guys here. So conjugacy class G has several elements. For example, in S3, there's a conjugacy class of transpositions, and there's a Nichols algebra of dimension 12 over this, over this uh, conjugacy class with a signed representation of the centralizer. So this is a three-dimensional guy in the Drinfield center of S3, and yet it's a Nichols algebra of dimension 12. And if you go up as four as five, are very big Nichols algebras here, eight million. Um, and for uh, starting as starting six, we all believe it's infinite dimensional, which corresponds to several other things that happen at going from as five to six, but it's not proven. I think it's still open. Um, so the, first, the upper row, you see all these, these symbols. And then if you start to construct semi-simple objects, you start with semi-simple objects and try to get finite dimensional Nichols algebras. Um, then, uh, well, they started with, with constructing small examples. Um, and at some point I gave a construction of how you can compute Nichols algebras or construct Nichols algebras basically by an orbifold method. So those are all quantum groups, but they're folded by a, by a automorphism. And then you get Nichols algebras over groups which are slightly non abelian. So they are central extension of abelian groups. So the Drinfeld center of some, some, maybe extra special group or something. And, and then there was at some point the stratification result by Hecken, Berger, Wendel, I mean, which basically showed that that's all you can get together with a couple of exceptions in low rank. Um, and the funny thing is that somehow the existence of at least two roots restricts the, the uh, restricts the, um, what ha can happen so much that actually you, you, you know all the, the simple roots. So somehow all these weird cases above can only appear as rank one. There is no finite dimensional semi-simple Nichols algebra including that. So, yeah. So I can still say a couple of words about this, but maybe, uh, yeah, maybe first ask questions about this. So the rest of the time we have. So that is now uh, sort of the state of the art. If you look in these two examples in VECT A or in Dreadful center of Rep G for a non abelian fan. But then there's, of course, lots of other questions you can ask, right? I mean, you can uh, you could go into a category of an affine Lie algebra, integral level, and ask what are the Nichols algebras. Or you can go over a quantum group 
and look what our Nichols algebra is through with a quantum group. People get examples from these parabolic restrictions. Like you can ask several questions which are not part of this program. I think so at some point, uh, they very much concentrated on this program, which I think is very good because you really get difficult results. But, but I mean, there is much more examples out there that are maybe to, to ask in this room much more natural. Start with something in your favorite beta category. Yes, questions to this? No, <laughs> I can I have more slides. Yeah. Just uh, uh, I can a little bit explain about that. But the, the, let's let's say that the point the point will be in the next lecture. So I will completely drop this topic and go to to VUAs and CFTs. And the point will be that that you have screenings, non-local screenings. So there's defined in terms of elements and modules, not in terms of elements of the VUA. And that's why we have a non-trivial braiding. Um, and these these non-local screenings, you can ask what type of algebras do they generate? And I claim it's always the Nichols algebra associated to the object you used in the respective braided tensor category. That's the only input you have. You have the braiding and the associate. And that's what I will do next time. And let me also say as an upshot for, for, for next time afterward, maybe, um, the idea is, suppose I have a VUA realizing some braided tensor category like vector A, and I take an object and I use the screenings and I take the kernel of screenings, I get a much more complicated vertex algebra like triplet. It has to be again a modular tensor category. What could it be? I mean, in general, if you ask this question in general, I think the only thing it can be is the Drinfeld center of modules over the respective Nichols algebra inside the category you started with, because that's always a modular tensor category. And for triplet and the other examples I look at, this is true. So somehow that's the upshot for why we do this now. So somehow it's it's the natural algebra of derivations you can associate to a braided object. And I claim that screenings with monodromy, so non-local screenings, generate this algebra, and that the kernel of screenings sort of, but I cannot not prove this only in very small cases, of course, uh, the second statement, um, that the kernel of screenings somehow is a representation category exactly extended by modules over this algebra of screenings and the Drinfeld center of it. And that matches what we find in uh, these cases. So that's the upshot. So let's maybe spend, I mean, we still have 15 minutes. Let's briefly review this construction just because I did it at some point and I found it nice. Um, so the question is now, how do we construct, um, how do we construct Nichols algebras that are uh, over non-abelian groups? And I think this is a quite nice pattern. So I try to explain it from my today's perspective and not from uh, back then, 2012. That was actually my PhD thesis. Um, so let's do the following. So, okay, oh, we use the wrong language, sorry. <laughs> so let X be in the Drinfeld center of rep gamma. Hop algebra way of stating that is it's a gamma gamma you have Drinfeld module. So this is an, maybe a billion group, for example. It doesn't have to be, but let's assume. So, for example, the main example for this would, of course, be U, Q, G, plus. So, this in vect R to the N. So, it's the Borel part of a quantum group. It generates the Nichols algebra. So, B of X can be maybe the Borel part of a quantum group. Now, now I define as the following notion. We have an action on the group on X. And what this does, we will denote this by theta Z. Uh, some maybe Z2 Z or Z3, and how this acts is as follows. So suppose we have a given as a data, a central extension of the group gamma by the dual group, so be canonical, so by the group of homomorphisms of this to, to, to C, some central extension. And I choose a section and I have a corresponding cosine. Then, then I, I, want, I want an action of this group set on X, such that it 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 commutes with the with the um, with the half braiding, and the action it doesn't commute exactly with the action of g uh, of of uh, gamma on it, but the action is um, twisted in the following way. So acting with the group element on this x, and then acting with this automorphism is the same as doing the other way around, but changed by this factor. And if you know a little bit about uh, Twisting, and it's exactly the, the twisting of this. So somehow it's a non-trivial monoidal structure. So this is a definition you can make. So it's a, it's a it's a way how Z can act on the center of rep gamma on elements in the center, but not exactly 
keeping the object in, in the center, but it's somehow twisted a little bit. So um, you can do this. And now you can take this X as a vector space, define a new G action of G by pulling back the action of gamma. So this set star X trivial. And I can act, uh, define a half braiding using eigenspaces of, so somehow I have, in, the, in the original one, I have guys graded by this gamma. And now I have several pre-images. So they differ by an element here. And the different pre-images are now identified with different eigenvalues of the automorphism. So that model is the automorphism acting on the group gamma, and that somehow gives me gives me additional data. And by this, I sort of yeah extend it. So what this gives, and you can prove this, is this gives irreducible elements in the Drinfield center of this extended group. Um, and in fact, with the same Nichols algebra as an algebra, but with a different root system. And let's look at a very easy example. So the easiest example is an example that Milinsky and Schneider did by hand 2000. It was the first example of a Nichols algebra for the non-building group. And it comes out as the smallest case of my construction. So let's take the dihedral group. So this is an extension of Z2 cross Z2 by Z2. Um, and in the dihedral group, so there's here X and Y, but I'm not here pre-images, X tilde and Y tilde. And the pre-images have here some some uh, non-trivial commutativity. And so the conjugacy classes in D4 are X and the other pre-image of X and Y and the other pre-image of Y. And now let's look at an element in the center that is, has the following characters. So I'm writing here the decoration is X and Y. And here I write how X acts and how Y acts. So now this is an element in the center of rep Z2 plus Z2. And there is this twisted outer automorphism here. So it changes the sign here, but it's an, it's an automorphism. And what you get is exactly a Nichols algebra of dimension four times four times four over this uh, dihedral group. And what this exactly means, and I, oh, you can also do this of course for E6 and get an F4. I think this is quite cute. And you have to check how you do the decorations right, but maybe that's a combinatorial question. Um, and let me maybe go to this. So uh, what, I, what I can prove is also conversely, whenever I have a, a, a Hopf algebra over a centrally extended group, where this here is central in the whole Hopf algebra, then this corresponds to this construction. So it's a, it's a back and forth. And then, as I said, uh, Heckenberger went running classified all Nichols algebras, and they basically, over non abelian groups, and they basically found that the series you get from here, so you take any quantum group with an outer automorphism, you get some slightly non abelian Nichols algebra over some non abelian group. And those are basically all, except for small reg examples. And recent work with uh, uh, Guillermo San Marco, who was in the conference, and Ivan Angiono, um, is that, in fact, all finite dimensional Nichols algebras you can get, except for these small exceptions, are twists, co cycle twists of this construction. And we can also compute all Hopf algebras that belong to it. So now we have sort of a classification. So there was this classification of pointed Hopf algebras where Hecken, Anduskevich and Schneider said, let's take an arbitrary Hopf algebra and we assume that the semi-simple part is an abelian group. Then let's classify all possible Hopf algebras. And basically what they do is they classify all possible Nichols algebras and then they prove that there is no more. They took chicken somehow by hand that there is no more. And somehow we, we did this now for for non-abelian co-radicals. So we know now all Hopf algebras where the semi-simple part is a non-abelian group. And I want to state it in that way because I think it's interesting, for me too difficult, but um, an interesting question to ask, can we somehow generally ask this question for tensor categories? So is there a notion of a the semi-simple part of a tensor category such that I can ask, so modular tensor categories are difficult. Non-simple ones are even more difficult. But suppose I am given a semi-simple modular tensor category. Can I ask for what are all non-semi-simple modular tensor categories where the semi-simple part is this fixed one? And there's a proposition to get those. Let me take Nichols algebras in the semi-simple tensor category and take the Drinfeld center. So that way you get modular tensor, many modular tensor categories, um, which are, they're all bit equivalent, as Dimitri explained to me, of course. Um, so you get, but, but, the question is the more, and, and so far we don't know more. So all the quantum groups and so on, what we get from here, we get several examples of non-semi-simple tensor categories, always starting with something semi-simple and extending it, and, 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 and we, never get, we never get something different. 
And so somehow, somehow we can prove this in, so not me, I mean, Anders Kiewicz Schneider proved this somehow in the case that you start off with an abelian group. And this is now the proof if you start off with the drill field center of a non abelian group. And let me also say that in the, in the screening, um, in the screening interpretation, actually I had already, when I did this work on Nichols algebra, but I had no clue about screenings, but there was somehow this fascination for this procedure of orbifolding. So, so I think you can get, um, analoga of the screening business for these Nichols algebras by doing exactly what you think you do from this correspondence. Namely, you take a lattice view A with an orbifold, you take an orbifold model, but now again, you take short screenings. And the short screening, the orbifold model will exactly be again Nichols algebras like this. And then what do you get if you take the kernel of this? And I think, but I cannot prove this, that you sort of get again this extension of this center of this non abelian group by this Nichols algebra. So you get some non abelian Cartan part version of Hopf algebras, quantum groups. And those should be realized as kernel of screenings this way. So this is like, a, a, and I will say this in more detail, uh, maybe in the fourth lecture a little bit. But uh, yeah, maybe this is all I want to say. Thank you. Uh, for your questions. Uh, I'll ask one. Yeah. So you've uh, you called up all about the finite dimensional linear parameters. Are there background versions that they can pass about? So classified, no, there is work where Heckenberger somehow made a shot in the dark where we just classify like all rank two Nichols algebras and see which root systems they get, whether they feel affine or not. So a little bit the problem is that um, this, this dichotomy between um, the Titz cone is either a, a sphere or it is a plane, that is, let's say it's not clear how we would formulate this in general. So somehow I'm not sure if we have the right definition of what an affine Nichols algebra should be. But certainly what you can do is you can take a Q diagram, a QIJ that belongs to an affine Lie algebra and you get a Nichols algebra. And the root system theory works. I mean, it's not that there's some, some problems. The problem is more you don't really know how to define what affine actually means. Somehow you want infinite root, but not too bad behavior. So, so there's also work by Anders Kiewicz, Schneider, and, 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 and Angiono and, and Heckenberger where they try to for example, classify Nichols with finite, finite Gelfand Kittler's dimension and stuff like that. So you get more examples. Yeah. Let, let me maybe also add that from, from today's perspective, I would, this last construction, I would formulate probably very differently. Namely, what you actually do is um, you have a modular tensor category and you have an algebra inside the modular tensor category and you look at modules over this. Like a Nichols algebra, it doesn't have to be, but for example. Now you take a G crossed extension of the underlying category. Now you can look at modules in this G crossed extension over the side. So it's a much larger category. And that's actually what you get. It's like a G crossed extension of the semi simple part. And somehow this G crossed extension and taken modules over the Hopf algebra somehow commute. In two ways you get the same thing. Any more questions? That's one more stupid one. Please. So you had this classification and you had lots and lots of exceptions. You found it correctly, at least for some of these, you get uh, quality Hopf algebras and then you can take them for doubles. And end up with nice multiple events categories. Do you get interesting MPCs as well, or do you just get boring ones, weak card ones? So whether the interesting is a different question. <laughs> so first of all, you can do this for all of these examples, not just for some. So whenever I have a Nichols algebra in an arbitrary semi-simple, no, not even semi modular tensor category, I can take modules over it, take the Drinsfeld center. This gives me a non semi simple modular tensor category. It gives me also a Hopf algebra, or if you start with an associator, a quasi Hopf algebra, which looks like a quantum group and the Carton part is whatever you realize your initial category by, and your up Borel parts are sort of two copies of the Nichols algebra. So that always works. And you always get modular tensor categories, and whether they're interesting or not, maybe I'll leave to your fantasy. <laughs> I don't know what criteria we have to say it's interesting or not. So they include, of course, the super quantum groups. So let me say, um, yeah, I mean, from, from the one side, you could say what you get is, first of all, super Lie algebras. And then if you, if you classify, there has been work by other people very long years ago, um, super Lie algebras in characteristic P or Lie algebras in characteristic P, you get some more cases where somehow the root system stays finite because of this truncation effect. And all of these you get. So you somehow collect all the stuff that's happening in characteristic P beyond, and there's only exceptions, beyond your sort of usual Lee, Lee, Lee's types. And um, a different way of viewing them is in some, pe some paper with Kunz I had at some point. So we were studying how, when you have a big Nichols algebra or quantum group or so, and you take a parabolic and you restrict. So the root system makes parabolic restriction. So you intersect with some hyperplane. And categorically, what you do is you write your category as modules over some intermediate algebra, like some parabolic. 
Um, and then you can ask what the root system of this is. And in fact, we find, except for some low exceptions, all of these uh, root systems by this. So you can understand it like you have stuff like E8, but then you can do parabolic restrictions and you get weird new root systems because not always is it that the parabolic subalgebra is fixed under, under wide group action. So usually it's not. So usually you get some weird root system when you restrict a good root system. That's also something that I think people had not on the radar, even though it was actually there. You could always ask, what are restrictions of A4 on parabolics? But then there is a couple of nice ones, but usually you get a messed up root system like this. There are more questions? Let us thank. Thanks. Thanks.